It's very curious, but right at the start of this programme, I feel I have to stand here and almost apologise for liking that music so much. At least I feel I have to somehow justify uh, late 20th century musical language that's so direct, that's immediately engaging, that's inviting, that has all the qualities that for hundreds of years composers strive to achieve in their music. They're all creeping back into 20th century music, those features, directness, attractiveness, accessibility, such well-used tools as tonal language, and regular beat and clarity of texture. And they don't really require an apology, but a slight explanation. After 1945, there were composers in Europe who decided that Europe had to make a new start with a clean slate and in many ways with a guilty conscience. The past had to be expunged or at least ruthlessly edited and composers began to address the public in their own private languages. I went six years to Harvard University, got a very good education. Uh, by the end of the sixth year I was completely tied up into knots. Uh, because of the issue of modernism, modernism and, and method and, uh, and the tremendous uh, uh, spiritual and intellectual genuflection that, that American education makes to European culture. Yeah. So I decided instead of going to Europe to go to the ex other extreme and to go to San Francisco and become part of uh, what at that time was a very interesting, very free and flexible and almost anarchistic um, uh, community of artists. So, as a kind of reaction against this modernism, we have a young American composer, John Adams, who was steeped, saturated, lovingly in the record shelf tradition of his past, of our past, and who believes that deep down there's a common core to our society. And so he sets about celebrating that common core, and he invites his audience to celebrate with him. The major event of my youth was the day that my parents bought a, a record player home when I was when I was a kid. This is probably about 1958 or so, and um, I, I had I couldn't be pulled away from it even at dinner time. I, it was it was just uh, an obsession with me, and so for all of my uh, conscious life, I have had virtually the entire world's music at my fingertips, whether it was uh, Mahler or Sibelius or uh, Indonesian music or uh, Duke Ellington or uh, Elvis Presley or, or whatever. So uh, my musical pedigree is just a huge uh, a trash bin of, uh, of the whole world's uh, recorded music. And uh, worse uh, added to that is that uh, I seem to have this very loose filter when it comes to composing, very often uh, music just seems to come spewing out of me without uh, any kind of uh, uh, control mechanism. And I've learned that um, I seem to be at my best when I just let it come out and I not uh, uh, try to uh, censor it. In this program, we're going to look specifically at one recent work by John Adams, a full-scale opera completed in 1987 on the subject of Nixon in China. The music in the programme is two short arias from the opera and a larger purely orchestral piece called The Chairman Dancers, which is not actually part of the opera, but it could have been, and it was originally intended to be, and it's very much of the opera's essence. When I first heard and saw Nixon in China, I had to stop to think about what sort of an opera it was. I guess what it reminds me of most is a mask. And in such entertainments, the characters tended to be less independent beings, but rather personifications of human qualities or characteristics. 
And there was a very special relationship between the actors and the audience. Quite often, the actors were drawn from the audience, and the stage spectacle idealized the society that was that audience. And so the kings and queens and the aristocrats were the heroes and heroines of the drama. If they weren't literally members of the cast, which they often were, then at the end of the performances, they were invariably invited to step into the picture and join in a final celebratory dance, an invitation to the dance. Well, John Adams' society is late 20th century democratic America, where we're all aristocrats and where the most ordinary, our own elected representatives can be kings or queens, president and first lady. What we'll try to say in this program, and what I think John Adams' music is saying, or at least what it says to me, is that deep down we have a good society, or we believe it's possible to have a good society, and that the ideals of that society are still represented by the kings and queens, but they are now us, the ordinary people. In his modern mask is we who have the right now to step into the picture. And in musical terms, the ideals which we all share are still to be found, not in private and obscure musical languages, but in certain musical effects, if that's the right word, to which we always respond and to which we have always responded. Such effects are diatonic harmony, common tones, and regular pulse, simple time. And so Adams's project as a composer is how once again to give common tones in simple time the starring roles. The first aria is, is, is the monologue, or the interior monologue that Nixon does is just after he's stepped off Air Force One onto the tarmac in Peking. And my take on him was that he was very excited. He was probably jet lagged, just like I am right now. And um, um, very nervous because I think most people don't know this, but when Nixon came to China and the whole world was watching, uh, he didn't really not know whether Mao was going to grant him an interview. And uh, if Mao had not deigned to interview him, it would have been a major embarrassment. So there are small beads of sweat on the president's forehead as he steps down off the uh, uh, plane uh, and shakes hands with a, a virtually identical line of Chinese party officials. And as he does it, he reminds himself of the fact that he's on TV back home. He keeps sort of popping back into the realization, oh, I'm here, I'm, I'm in China, and the cameras are rolling, and, and it's really happening. And then he keeps sort of fading back into his reveries. It's interesting to get inside the mind of an American head of state mm. uh, and try to fantasize about how they view themselves in the world. And oh, he spoke quietly. This is not just an aria about surface events. It, it has other resonances, ideals, dreams, aspirations, paranoia. But at one level, it is about surfaces. The surface of flickering forms, which is the medium by which we get to know almost everything, the TV screen. The real thing is not Nixon in China, but the surface of a TV screen showing that Nixon is in China the real thing, in inverted commas. Everything hyped. When I first thought about writing for Richard Nixon, I, I asked myself, well, what kind of music would Nixon like? And what kind of music would um, Pat and Dick have fallen in love to? And it seemed manifest that um, it would be to white swing band uh, of the 40s. And this was a great opportunity for me because my parents were both uh, jazz musicians during the 30s. In fact, they met at uh, my grandfather's 
uh, dance hall. My mother sang with one small band and my father played clarinet and saxophone with another. So this is in my lineage, this is my, my musical birthright, and this was a wonderful opportunity, Nixon and China, to exorcise this, uh, this birthright and uh, my musical pedigree and to write for what is essentially a, a white swing band uh, with a very small vaudeville-sized uh, string section. Yet, this is a, a thoroughly modern 1980s band too, because among the more conventional instruments is a synthesizer, which as well as adding its own distinctive sounds and colors to the texture, is able to give the music an, an added glow, a sheen which is very appropriate to the, the hyper-reality of Nixon's vision. Colors 
from Nixon's aria, with all its energy and, and mock heroics, we move to a much more interior affair. Well, Pat Nixon's aria is, is I think, very touching. Um, it, it comes at the end of the scene. You have to imagine that Pat's been moved around picking at a sort of manic pace all day. I mean, she's begun the day with a, with a, a, a triple excedrin headache and been forced out into, into being happy and smiling. Uh, people have constantly been sort of pushing and trying to get a view of her. And for a moment, she's finally left alone. Everyone moves away. And um, we see her a really lonely, isolated figure in the midst of this huge kind of imposing uh, structure, the gate of heavenly peace. And she soliloquizes about... Um, what it means to be an American. And there are images that I, I think are so striking. They're simple images, they're banal, and yet I think they're very touching. I think it's a very Whitman-esque piece of poetry on, on Alice's part, because Whitman has that sense of the banal. He has that sense of the of almost unbearably sentimental, and yet at the same time, deeply moving. Uh, at one point in the aria, she says, um, Across the plain, one man is marching. The unknown soldier has risen from his tomb. I mean, that, that gives me shivers up the back just to say it. I, I, it may be something that only Americans can respond to, but the idea that this, this man, I mean, there's a sort of very subtle hint of the Vietnam vet coming back and not being appreciated. And she says, give him a share, uh, the prodigal. And, and uh, it's a deeply mo moving vision of America. Adam's music here is all simplicity. It's a kind of neutral style. And by the long drawing out of its repetitions, it somehow purifies itself of any reference to other music so that it becomes finally peculiarly itself and hints at its own profundities. It's clear that Adam's wanted such musical simplicity to reflect the personality and utterance of the character. 
Pat Nixon's aria is in fact the poetic and musical vision of a scene of happy innocence and routine, which is for her, middle America. And in this respect, the aria is a kind of pastoral idyll in which that scene of innocence is evoked in the simplest terms by a person of almost childlike perception. And so the restricted vocal range and its accompaniment suggests the ordinariness of the person and of her vision. Bat Nixon's words and, and Adam's music seem to be an attempt to smooth out life's imperfections by highlighting its symmetries. To, to gild its dullness with illusion and to purify the world by simplifying its textures. It's an appeal to let things be, not to manipulate or be manipulated. The irony of the aria is clear. A simple vision is here pictured by the first lady of the most powerful country on earth, midway through the first visit paid by an American president to the largest nation in the world. She gives voice to the common, simple, ordinary, shared feelings of middle Americans. And yet in so doing, both she and the composer are able to hint at expressive worlds beneath the surface of her words and his notes.
commission that I'd been putting off for many years and I knew that I had to write this orchestra piece before I could get down to the opera but the only thing on my mind was the opera and I thought well possibly if I write this foxtrot that Mao and Madame Mao are supposed to do in the final scene uh, I might be able to incorporate in the opera as it was it sort of got out of hand and so it's its own separate piece we're once again at a large banquet it's the last night the Nixon's are hosting a final banquet. Suddenly, Madame Mao gate crashes the banquet. She's not been invited. She appears in her Mao suit, but strips it off to reveal herself in her former identity, which some people may not know. She was, during the 1930s, a, a movie queen in sort of slightly seedy movies made in Shanghai. She's now dressed in stiletto heels and a long silk Chinese dress. And she goes over and she motions to the band, tells them to start to play, and begins this uh, foxtrot, which um, has a certain uh, kind of uh, come-hither quality to it. And she motions to Mao, who's present in his poster on the wall, and she says, come down, old man, come down and dance. And he says, why not? So this music was sort of my idea of what... It was a fantasy of what um, Chinese... Uh, movie music of the 1930s attempting to be like Hollywood but not quite knowing what Hollywood would be like so the movie, the music in the chairman dances in a sense is sort of um, movie music thrice removed So, this is the large-scale dance piece, which would have provided the real mask-like ending to the opera if the original intention had been kept. Here, reality moves over totally into fantasy. It's the hyper-reality of Mao and Chang Ching, transported from the peaking of 1972 in a state banquet to a time 40 years before in Yan'an, during the Long March, 
when apparently they danced together to the music of the gramophone. And to complete the mask analogy, it's a dance of the gods. She, the movie goddess, he, the god, enticed by her to come down as if from his statue and to recapture with her those far distant moments of intimacy. The wit and irony of this scenario, with its echoes of other immortals, like all those great dancers of the silver screen and the stars of those early Hollywood attempts at chinoiserie, are seized on by John Adams. For example, how wonderful is the moment when, having whipped up his orchestra in a sort of Stravinsky rite of spring frenzy, Adam suddenly cuts to the delicious bathos of Mao and Chang Ching as Fred and Ginger, dancing on a penny, as the composer said at rehearsal. He also said at rehearsal that this music is his idea of a Chinese communist idea of Hollywood movie music of the 1930s. And that's why this music works. You can somehow say these things again because of that kind of witty detachment, the irony of being three steps away. He said to the players while he was rehearsing it, he said, what this is is a third-hand misinformed piece of music. And all the hallmarks of his style are here. It's energy, it's wit, it's dazzle, and of course, it's immediately engaging. There's some quality to this music that makes you want to be a, a part of it from the start. Yet it's somehow become uh, mandatory in the 20th century that an artist uh, uh, create a surface that is thorny and difficult and obscure, and that if the uh, reader or listener wants to get in, uh, he or she has to uh, do a great deal of work uh, to kind of deserve uh, the meaning. You have to work to get the meaning. However, the, the far from thorny surface of Adams's music is created by a no less skillful use of a composer's art. His familiar tools, common tones in simple time, are combined with a real mastery of orchestration to produce a surface that dazzles and glitters. Yet precisely how does he achieve that glitter? Well, firstly, though the underlying pulse of the music is for the most part simple and regular, its symmetries are continually fractured and broken up by asymmetrical elements from different sections of the, the very large orchestra. However well one knows this music, it's actually virtually impossible every time you re-listen to it to guess exactly what's coming next. And the way the music's made to, to flicker and flash suggests the fractured images that make up screen pictures or those created on the floor of a discotheque by strobe lighting. What's magical about the disco floor is the way in which the dancer is, as it were, at one at the same time doing his dance and, and starring in the video of his own performance. And it seems to me that Adams' music in The Chairman Dancers acts in a similar way. Its spangled surface hints always at these two escapist paradises, the movie drome and the Palais de Danse. Dressed as they are in their dazzling orchestral clothes, these common tones seem to reappear as glamorous strangers. I've been playing around with that phrase, common tones in simple time, because it is actually the title of an early piece by John Adams. But common tones, by common tones, we're not talking here about just ordinary ideas, but deep down, what we have in common. Adams's is a vision in which community may be imagined again. And whatever ultimately you make of this music, 
It's a style of real wizardry. The sheer excitement of hearing what may be ordinary ideas so gloriously illuminated, for me, makes the show worthwhile.